it was like somebody kind of flipped the light switch, to be honest with you. It just sort of exploded. And we found ourselves in a position saying we can't do it all. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Skid Steer Nation podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Deemer. Before we dump into all the information today, I do want to remind everyone that this show is called the Skid Steer Nation podcast. So it's sponsored by skid steer nation so if you have a skid steer whether you own a business work on a farm have it for just tinkering around your property head over to skidsteernation.com and check out our portfolio of high quality american-made skid steer attachments they're all made right here in the united states of america we have kind of done the homework for you we vetted the manufacturers make sure the quality of the builds there and more importantly the customer service is there so you can rest easily with your purchases from skidsteernation.com well, guys, today I'm excited to introduce to you Neil Girardi. He's up in Harrington, Delaware. He and his father have a septic system business. His dad started it in the 80s, and Neil's now taking it into 2024 and beyond. Um, before I introduce Neil to the show, I do want to talk about something that's been on my mind lately. We've been doing a lot of exercises personally for myself and the business about vision mapping and planning our long-term goals. And it sounds so simple to say, hey, what's your 10-year goal? And at, at that point, you kind of get stuttered and unsure of what to say or what you really want in your life. And then if you actually can lay out what your goals are in three, five, 10 years, it feels overwhelming and like it's a million miles away and it's so hard to get there. So what we've been really focused on is taking our big, hairy, audacious goal for the future and breaking it down into steps along the way. Like, where do we need to be at five years to hit our 10-year goal? Where do we need to be at three years? Where do we need to be at one year? And this is where the magic happens. After you get to one year, we started breaking out everything into quarters. We call them 90-day years. And then from those 90-day years, we break them down into individual months, individual weeks, into daily tasks. And as long as you commit to doing those daily tasks, you are on your way to hitting your long-term goal. It's working for us. We saw a drastic difference in our team's performance and my own personal mentality. And if you just have the power to, to be consistent with your actions every day, those goals are closer than you think. Remember, houses are built brick by brick. So that's my two cents of advice before we jump into today. So with no further ado, Neil Girardi, Girardi Family, oh, sorry, Girardi Septic Services, Harrington, Delaware. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah. And we were talking before the show started that, you know, most of our guests lately have always been newer to the game and they've started their own business where you kind of come in as a legacy owner and you have, you know, we talked for a moment, like you get a lot of the outside people saying, oh, it must be nice. Like you're getting a business that your dad helped build. But at the same point, you've been part of this for a really long time yourself and to be uh -huh. able to take, take the knowledge and the expertise that he's got be open-minded to hear that. Like I'm assuming the pitfalls and trials and tribulations you guys have had in the last 10 years are nothing in, in comparison to what he dealt with in the, in the eighties. Well, so, you know, early eighties, um, you know, when, when my parents had me, they were young. Um, my, uh, my dad had just recently, just prior to me coming into the world, he had took a job with, uh, actually with the state of Delaware, with our, you know, our state government, uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife in particular. And, um, you know, he went there for the benefits. He didn't go for the money because um, everybody knows, you know, <laughs> our state employees, they're, they're not, unfortunately, uh, you know, the highest, highest paying jobs out there. Um, but you couldn't find anything better in terms of benefits at the time. And uh, so, you know, shortly after he had been there a while, it was, it became sort of evident to him that, you know, he needed to do something to put a little extra cash in his pocket, you know. And so he he started out early as as part of his his tr training at his, you know, at his full time job. He had an opportunity to learn how to run a drag line, which is a, a dinosaur of machine in today's age in terms of the small ones. I mean, obviously, they're still using them in the mines and everything. But um, the smaller drag line cranes that they were using for doing pond work and stuff. Uh, back then, you just don't see many of them anymore. And uh, so he uh, he got the opportunity, um, I guess, if you want to call it that, to to master the art of, of running a drag line. And he had an opportunity at a young age to buy one. And uh, he bought it and started doing basically kind of, you know, part time weekend stuff 
back then all the farmers, you know, they were irrigating out of ponds. Uh, the technology for submersible uh, electric motors and stuff, you know, wasn't there in terms of the agriculture industry. Um, they were still pumping out of ponds, tax ditches, things like that. So he found a little niche there where he was able to, to do a lot of irrigation ponds, some wildlife ponds. He did a lot of uh, sediment pit cleanouts for the potato farmers that we have around here where they wash potatoes every year out of the packing house. Um, and he did that for several years. Um, it was a good little side gig and, um, you know, put some extra money in his pocket so, you know, he could live comfortably. And, and he kind of rolled with that for a few years. Um, then when I, I guess when I was probably... 10, 12 years old, the, the machine he had was, uh, was really old, was outdated. Um, so he bought a second one, not that it was a whole lot newer, but it was a little <laughs> better shape. And, um, so when he bought that one, I kind of got the opportunity at that point to, to start learning and experimenting and playing around on the other machine that was always sitting. And, um, eventually I got to the point where, you know, where I was running it and that's kind of where my, I guess the dirt bug kind of bit me, so to speak. Um, my grandparents had a farm when I was growing up. So, you know, I was used to being on the farm in the dirt and that kind of thing. But there was there was just something different about moving massive amounts of earth. You know, I, it sounds weird, but um, once it gets in your blood, it's just something you kind of can't shake. And um, I, I think anybody that's in the business is probably nodding their head going, yeah, I know what you mean. We, we have days where we, you know, we cuss the business, you know, we say we've had all we can take, but there's, there's just something there that, that wants to bite you, you know, you're, you're hooked. Neil, um, I always, I always joke that like working in this business is a lot like a golf game because you can have 98 terrible shots, but as long as you have one of those shots, that's like right. a sweet spot right down the middle, right. like you're ready, you're ready to play another round of golf. And like this mm -hmm. business is the same way. Like you have one day a year where it's just pure bliss and you're like, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Absolutely. And so, you know, you, you work hard all year long and you, you know, you take those jobs on that, you know, halfway through them, you're scratching your head saying, why did I do this? Or, you know, why did I tackle this? Um, but then you get that, you know, that, that one nice job a year that, you know, everybody loves, you know, so many things, especially in today's, um, today's world, you know, there's, there's so many things in the ground that very rarely do you ever just get to go out and be able to dig a hole or move dirt without worrying about, you know, a sewer line, a water line, an electric line. Um, so when we, when we get those big jobs where it's just moving earth, you know, whether it be a wildlife pond or wetland site or something like that, like those are the ones that, at least for me, kind of give me that opportunity to sort of sit back and take a breath and say, you know, th this is kind of why we do it. This is what we really love. You know, we do the other stuff because you have to, but this is what we, you know, we really eat up. And, and, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, so uh, long story short, you know, uh, after, after several years of, of weekends and side hustles and things with the cranes, um, we started seeing, um, started seeing a decline in the need for it. The, the technology began to advance in terms of uh, the submersible well pumps and the irrigation technology. The farmers didn't have the need to spend money on ponds and stuff anymore when they could put a well in. Um, the, uh, the long reach excavators started to increase in popularity. Um, you started seeing more contractors with those machines. So the 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 drag line work the pond work and stuff it it started to slow down because you know now we had newer technology out there you know guys that were uh, running the long reaches advertising for pond cleanouts and things like that so machines were getting old so he said well we need to look at another avenue you know what what can we do here to to, to move this part-time gig forward and, you know, kind of keep doing what we've been doing, but we need to find a sort of another, an alternate route, you know? So that's when the, uh, the septic system deal uh, sort of came into play. Um, we, we have a, um, a local builder here to us who, who my dad went to school with, was real good friends with. Um, they did kind of a joint venture thing for a few year, few years there, uh, we would do all their septic work and stuff and a lot of the lot work. And, uh, 
And then finally, I guess about, uh, I don't know, six, maybe eight years ago, we branched out a little more. Um, he, uh, he ultimately retired from the state after 33 years of service and um, uh, retired at a relatively long, young age. You know, he's in his late 50s, so uh, I wasn't going to let him slack off. You know, I made sure we kept, <laughs> kept plenty for him to do. So we, uh, we had bought a low boy and was doing a lot of uh, heavy haul moves for the local cat dealer and uh you know several other customers around here moving a lot of equipment and we still had you know our backhoe and some other equipment and stuff and all of a sudden um not really sure what what happened but the the dirt work and the septic work and all the other stuff that went along with it just it was it was like somebody kind of flipped the light switch, to be honest with you. It just sort of exploded. And we found ourselves in a position saying we can't do it all. I think we're all familiar with today's world in terms of finding help. It just wasn't easy to try to find somebody to, to put in the low boy that we didn't have to worry about a lot of things. Um, so ultimately, we made the decision it's, it's time to, to sell the truck and uh, focus a little more effort on onto the, you know, the dirt work, the septic work and that type of thing. So that's what we did. We ended up, we sold it. We ended up buying another triaxle dump truck in, in, in place of it. And um, we've got two trucks running pretty much full time every day for the most part, except for now we have one in the shop that we're putting a motor in. Uh, there's one of those trials and tribulations we talked about. Uh, not necessarily a planned event, but what are you going to do? Um, and so we have been just hot and heavy for the last four to five years, as hard as we could go with septic work, dirt work, demolition, um, pond work, um, you name it. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of different stuff, which is pretty cool because it's not, it's not the same old, you know, monotonous thing every day, you know, one day might be some septic work we're doing next week. You know, we may move into a site and start a pond. Um, it's uh, I like the fact that we, we do a lot of different stuff. Um, we recently completed a, an odor control uh, upgrade for a, a local um, was an old chicken processing facility that was uh, in Sussex County here. Local to us was recently bought by a, by another worldwide company, um, they compost, they make organic topsoil and stuff. They compost, uh, you know, whether it be dead chickens or chicken waste from the processing plants. Um, so their odor control unit, basically a big bed of wood chips, so to speak, was depleted. So we went in, we actually dug all that out, um, took all the depleted media out replaced all the all the piping and everything inside on the concrete floor all the ads perforated pipe that they blew the air through um put all new piping in all new wood chips back in uh so that was a kind of something that was different sort of out of the ordinary you know little little change of pace so to speak but but yeah it's cool i mean we we get to do a lot of different stuff and uh you know that's the kind of stuff that makes it worthwhile for me <clears throat> very nice very nice so Neil, I, as you talk through all that, one of the things that really caught me was as agricultural technology was catching up, the need for the, the pond for irrigation ponds and all that, you guys saw that starting to diminish. Were you actively involved in the business with that point time yet, or was it still primarily so, just your father? So it, primarily at that time, it was still just him. Now I say that. So in terms of being Hands on into the nitty gritty. No, I wasn't into it a lot, but I was one of those kids that um, I never took a real big interest in sports and things like that. When I was in school, um, when I came home from school, I was I was on the farm working, um, running time to get to work, doing something. I got you. And well, uh, so yeah. with when he was in the business on the weekends, when he was working, I was there with him. You know, yeah. I don't know how many hours I spent standing on the running board of a 22 BB Sire series, uh, <laughs> but it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the reason I wanted to ask if you were a part of it at that point or not is I feel like there's a lot of business owners that reach a point where they kind of have a crossroads where, hey, I'm comfortable doing this work and I really don't want to change and shift, but I really feel like the market's 
dictating the change. And some mm -hmm. people move quick and then they, you know, they become the leader in the new field that they go into and others move late and now they're mm -hmm. lagging behind or some just don't move at all. And those businesses are out of business. So right. like, where, where was your dad at in that? Like, did he spot that trend coming really early? So he, he saw it, you know, early on being, so with his job that he worked full time, a lot of what he did was, um, he did a lot of work in the wetlands areas out on the marsh, rebuilding, uh, dikes, you know, beachfront replenishment, things like that, uh, impoundment work. And so he kind of saw, um, you know, working for the state, you know, they, they, they had monies every year budgeted to buy new equipment and things like that. And so, so there was projects that he did where they would rent equipment and things like that. So he kind of seen it coming because doing that kind of work, he, he sort of saw a little faster, you know, the the technology that was going to be out there and, and be available and, and and saw it coming. You know, he was they were renting long reach excavators to yeah. do work out on the marsh with. And so it was evident that, you know, it was coming. Um, obviously, he didn't know for sure, you know, how long it was going to be before the guys in the private sector sure. really started, you know, investing in this type of equipment and things like that. But we knew that ultimately it was going to come. And then of course, on the flip side of that is he also knew that he had, you know, two old aging pieces of equipment that unfortunately, no matter how well you maintain them, nothing Mist lasts forever. Yeah. Um, so that was the other thing. And certainly it wasn't cost effective to try to, you know, upgrade so, to a newer one at that point. Um, you know, the, the, the money just wasn't there for the, it. You the know? work slowing down. Why invest more right. into it? Totally. So, why septic systems? Like, what was the thought process? Well, you know, I can't honestly tell you that the thought of the septic systems was was something that he had been thinking about, so to speak. It wasn't necessarily something that was on his mind. Um, it, it was honestly, it was more, we kind of more stumbled upon it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, he had always he had a lot of experience in doing, you know, grade work, earth moving, that type of stuff in general. But when he got the opportunity or was presented with an opportunity to do the, the first install, you know, he was always one of them guys that he, he could do anything. Um, I don't care if it was carpentry, welding and fabrication, operating equipment. I mean, there, there literally wasn't anything that the man couldn't do. Um, and, so it was presented to him and he said, yeah, I'll put it in. So he, um, you know, he took the test, he went and got his license, he put it in and, and it was kind of one of those when he was done, he was like, yeah, that's not bad. I think there could be an opportunity to make some money there, you know? And that was sort of where it started from. Now in the years since then, um, uh, you know, we've, we've done thousands of installations over the years when I was in my early, well, late teens, I guess, 18, 19, um, I had actually gotten my installer's license, um, you know, knowing that ultimately I was headed down that road as well. And then since then, you know, I've advanced on that. I've got some other licenses, you know, for inspections and different thing. And last I knew, I'm actually one of only four people in the state who carries a level four license. Now, that may have changed recently. I'm not sure. But essentially, that means that you know, I'm able to work on any type of system that is approved for use in the state of Delaware, whether it be a gravity, a LPP, a mound system, you know, peat, uh, peat biofilter, um, rib spray irrigation. I mean, you, you name it, it's, I'm, I'm covered yeah. for all of them, uh, which is a huge asset to us, obviously. Well, absolutely. Because if you've got a unique system that needs to be installed, like you're limited to the companies that are qualified to do it and you've only got to yeah. compete with three other competitors for yeah and, and those have got to be more fun because you don't do them every day well you don't and and so a lot of that stuff at, at least in our state um a lot of the regulations and things have changed so they're they're not doing nearly the amount of those types of large systems that they used to do um however everything that's out there and in operation still has to be maintained um so that that was the other thing um, or one of my kind of go-to things here with being in the wastewater business is no matter what happens, if, if the economy were to crash tomorrow, 
new houses stopped being built, new shopping centers stopped going up, you name it. There's always going to be a need for water and wastewater. And I, I find the water and wastewater sector to be a pretty interesting um, avenue. Uh, There's a, there's a lot to it. Um, You know, I, I get involved in stuff all the way from, you know, the installation of septic systems and things like that, all the way down to, you know, working with guys every day that are water and wastewater plant treatment operators and things like that. Um, There's such a huge hole in the industry right now of skilled professionals to fill those, those positions, whether it be water and wastewater operators, um, you know, there, there's, there's such a big void there. I mean, that, that's one thing that, that our country or even probably worldwide, truth be told, is really hurting for is people that are willing to, to get into that profession. And there's just so much to it. I mean, you, people think of a, a wastewater treatment plan as just a place that, you know, everything goes to and gets treated. But when you really look at the science behind it, you know, what goes into it, I don't think I've ever seen another industry uh, aside from maybe the medical profession that has as many acronyms um, for, for what goes on there every day, you know, everything has an abbreviation and it's, uh, it's, you know, B O D T S S. I mean, all that stuff, there's just so much science to it. And, um, it, it really is a, it, it's, it's, there really is an art to running, yeah. you know, a treatment plant. And, um, and I, yeah. Like, so my, brother-in-law works for the, the city of Peoria and he doesn't, he's a carpenter, but he has to work at all the different facilities. And right. even before that, like you, we would go down past that. My friends own some excavation companies out of right out of town. It was by the plant, but it, it is interesting to see how they have it all broke out, the different places, how the water moves within the facility. My personal takeaway, it smells terrible. Mm-hmm. Duh, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And then I used to, we used to be big avid like duck and goose hunters. Okay. And I'll never forget sitting like out there one day at his excavation place. And I was looking out at the wastewater plant and I just watched these mounds of Canadian geese out there eating feces out of the water. Uh huh. And I was like, I might shoot them, but I'm never eating one again. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. And, and it is, it is a common thing. We have it here too. Um, the, uh, the ducks and the geese, they love them. Um, myself and my dad and, and my boys, I have twin, uh, 13 year old identical twin boys and they are just absolutely ate up with waterfowl hunting it's, and um it's like it's it's like catching the dirt bug man like once you do it <laughs> once once you get that bird to lock in and just like hover yep. you're like i'm hooked i'm i it's the coolest thing in the world i want to go every day yep yep that's them they if, then, if they can then you go realize every day, how they expensive would... is it is yes yes uh you, you're you're not telling me nothing believe me um but uh, but yeah, it's um, it's it's pretty fascinating to me the the whole water and wastewater um, sector in general. There's just so many different, you know, different pieces of the puzzle, and there's so many different different people, different roles um, that that go into to making these things work. And um, you know, truthfully, I just I I enjoy being a part of that. It's it's a, a little piece of the pie that keeps the wheel turning, you know, and um, the on-site thing, the septic work, excuse me, is uh, is very similar. Shares a lot of the same same sort of uh, you know thought principles behind it, but it's on a smaller scale. And um, it's you know we we I at least take a lot of I get a lot of satisfaction out of you know going out to a customer knowing that we're we're giving them 110 percent. We're giving them the best possible job we can give them for what we think is a fair price and we, you know, we stand behind our work. Um, You you see so many, you hear so many horror stories these days about, you know, different contractors, whether it be septic contractors or carpenters or whatever, you know, they show up half the work and then they don't come back and finish or they don't do a good job. Um, And that is one thing that we, at least myself, and I know my dad does too, we, we take a lot of pride in knowing that when we leave, um, we sleep well at night because we know we've done as good a job as anybody could possibly do for them. And if there is an issue, we, you know, we take care of it. 
Um, it's a, it's a huge investment, you know, let's face it. Most, some of these septic systems you put in today, you know, they can go anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 nowadays. And your average homeowner, especially in today's economy, unfortunately, most of us just don't have 40, 50 grand laying around that when something goes wrong, we can shell it out. And, um, so we do a lot of work with our local government uh, through the grant program. Uh, we've turned a lot of people on to that. There's money out there to assist the homeowners in getting their septics replaced when they're failing. So is that um, real real quick? I don't want to cut you off, but no, no, you're to, is that a local program or a federal program? So it is it, the program is is through through the state government, but it's it's funded on a grant um, that, if I'm not mistaken, is um, through the federal government. Uh, I don't know all the details of it. I'm not going to pretend that I do. Um, but there's a, there's a huge pot of money there that is set aside as part of the environmental, um, budget or whatever that they have. And, um, so, a- so Neil, if you were to move your business to Montana, Illinois, Florida, anywhere else in the country, and you wanted to learn about that, like, what steps would you take to find out if you're, if the local government was tied into that federal grant? So every state obviously is different. You know, we, we border Maryland and it's quite frankly, it's pretty surprising how much difference there is in the way things are handled state to state when it comes to on-site regulations. Um, in Delaware, everything is done through the Department of Natural Resources, through the, through that state agency. You know, they have a, a groundwater section that does all the permitting for septic systems um, and all, all that type of stuff. Uh, when you step next door uh, right across the line here into Maryland, Maryland does everything on a county by county basis. So your licenses to, to be a licensed installer are actually given by the county, not by the state. Um, they And it's actually done through the county health department. Um, versus their Department of Natural Resources. So that seems counterintuitive to me. Yeah. Like, you have to have a specialist in every county's health department to actually say, yes, you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you just got a bunch of book readers saying, well, that looks right to me. Yeah. Like, yeah um, the quality it, of installers has to be diminished by well, doing it on a county by county basis. You know, so every county you work in, you have to be licensed in, obviously. Now, some of the, the, um, some of the training, some of the certifications and stuff that is done on a uh, on a state level through the Maryland, you know, Department of Environment or whatever. Um, but it, but it is it's 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 a county by county thing, and there's a lot of states that do it that way. Delaware is an extremely small state compared to well, just about any of them really. But if you look, you know, if you go out in the Midwest, you look at a big state like you know, say Texas for example. I mean. That to me sort of makes sense to do things on a county level just because of the size. I mean, there's no way one department could handle all that for, you know, a state the size of Texas. Delaware definitely is a little different. You know, we only have three yeah. counties here. Um, the, you know, the, the, the size of the state is much smaller and it's obviously much more easy to manage. But you um, have the blue hens. Yes, we do. We do. You have the blue hens. We, we have the blue hens. Um, they, uh, but it's it's. So if there was somebody that is in another state that was interested in finding out about that, whether it be a contractor or a homeowner, um, you know, my first call would be to to that county's um, board of health because the, the most um, most of these bigger states they're doing it at a county level. Um, and they should be able to point you, you know, in the right at least direction. Guide you where you that. need to go, what what right. department, what, who who's in charge of, or whatever. So, Absolutely. Because yeah. I wonder how many contractors out there actually know about the grant. Like, how much well, business are they leaving on the table because the homeowner can't afford it, and you they're know, not even able to provide them with a possible option. So it, it's funny that you say that because there is definitely um, there's definitely a void there uh, when it comes to knowledge around the grant program. And I, I really, I can't say for sure whose lap that falls in. Um, but what I can say is that I've had numerous customers call me 
you know, and, and want to want a quote or want a proposal on an install. And, you know, after I get to talking to them, you know, the, the everybody makes the comment, oh, it's so expensive. You know, I don't know where I'm going to get the money from. And, you know, so a lot of them I ask, you know, I say, well, well what what is your situation? You know, how how, how long have you lived here? Um, you know, is it is this your primary residence? Because those are two of the three caveats and um, or of the two of the three qualifications. Nine times out of 10, their answer is yes. And I'll ask them, I'll say, you know, has anybody talked to you or mentioned to you about the possibility of, you know, having it funded through the grant program? And their answer is no. And in my mind, the grant program is nice for a couple of reasons. One is obviously it doesn't have to come out of the homeowner's pocket. That's the biggest thing is people can actually now afford to replace their septic system. But secondly, the check is cut directly to the contractor from the state. So it takes all the worry of being a business owner and having to collect your money out of the equation. Maybe it takes you 30 days to get it. As I had two questions when you were done, and one of them was how what's how long of a, of a delay is there for payment? Yeah. So all the ones we've done, I mean, we have a, a really good relationship with the folks in that office. And if we do one, they give us a deposit. So we get part of the money up front. And then the balance is collected within 30 days of completing the job. I will wait 30 days for the balance of my money any day of the week versus having to track somebody down and hound them for six months to try to yeah. get them to pay their bill. And um, with that grant program, Neil, like what percentage of the installation is covered through that is like on the so, homeowner side. So they've actually recently just changed it. So prior uh, in years past, basically it would, it would cover a hundred percent that included that included the design fees uh, or the, you know, the engineering uh, by the engineer, as well as the site evaluation um, or the soil work that had to be done ahead of time. Um, all that was included with the caveat that the homeowner was forced to use the engineer and the soil scientist that was on contract with the state of Delaware. So a lot of times, you know, I recommend to my customers, listen, if you can afford to do it, Take care of your soil work and take care of your design fees out of pocket. You're talking two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars that would have to be paid out of pocket. It's still a whole lot less than having to foot the bill for the whole ball of wax yourself. But the beauty of that is when you go to them, you already have your soil work and your design work done, so you have more say in the design. You're able to pick who you want to use. I mean, engineers and soil scientists are just like, you know, it's it's just like when you buy a car, you talk to a couple, uh, you know, a couple car dealers and maybe you just don't get a warm and fuzzy about the one or you don't like the deal they're offering. And you say, I want to talk to somebody else. Well, part of making that decision, you know, when you're investing 40,000 or more potential dollars you really should have a good feeling with the people that you're working with. You know, you should have a, a good feeling that your your engineer that's doing your design work has got your best interest at heart. You should have the opportunity to discuss with him future plans that you may have down the road to do in your backyard, because ultimately that all can affect, you know, what you need to do now. Um, so I always tell people if they can afford to do that, to do it because you can you can have more involvement in the design, more say in what goes on, uh, and then you go to them and ask for assistance for the actual installation. Okay. Um, now they've recently just changed it to where uh, some of what they consider the IA systems, which is innovative and alternative systems, uh, that's anything that's going to have like an advanced pretreatment unit for it. Um, advanced nitrogen removal and things like that. Those are required to have a, a two year O and M contract on them that has to be signed at the time of construction. So it used to be the homeowner had to pay that, which roughly two year contract, like on a, a pure flow peat system is going to run you 15, 1600 bucks a year. 
they finally recently changed it that now we can actually include all that into the price as well. Okay. Um, so technically speaking, they can actually get it done without spending a so, single dime. Uh, how of many of your customers qualify for this? Uh, I would say on average, probably easily 50 to 60% of the, the people we work for would qualify for this. That's mind blowing. How many people actually use it? That 50, same 50%? Um, so I can tell you that a hundred percent of the customers that I have offered it to that qualified, obviously have taken advantage of it. Um, if, if I had to take a stab at it, there's probably, there's probably in the neighborhood of, I, I bet there's, I bet there's probably 250 to 300 septic systems septic systems a year easily that that people are missing out on oh uh, my goodness. taking advantage of because they don't know um our you know our state in, in my opinion i don't think that the state has done a fantastic job of advertising it um just recently i've started to see some things come out on social media be it facebook or whatever about some assistance for things like septic tank pumping and stuff like that. But the word just really, it, it isn't getting out there. Um, and that's why, you know, I make sure I present it to all my customers. Um, it's a win-win, you know, they, they get it done for free if they qualify, obviously. Um, and it, it's a win-win for the contractor because you don't have to worry about getting paid. It's, uh, it's guaranteed money. They still solicit bids, you know, there's still a bid process and everything that goes with it. How so, many bids yeah. how many bids do they have to get if they use so the program? Typically speaking, <clears throat> they will request three bids on behalf of the applicant. Now, with that being said, the applicant is not required, at least not as of now, to take the low bid. So if they, you know, if they have a contractor that gives them a real, real good, cheap price, but they just aren't feeling it for whatever reason, they're not required to take that that low price. Now, obviously, if they get a price that's just absolutely ridiculous, you know, somebody trying to really work the system, that's yeah. going to throw a red flag up. But they're issuing enough permits and enough checks and putting enough in. They 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 know, have they know the average ideas. rain by system. So right. let me ask you one more question then. Have you ever introduced a customer to the program and not gotten the bid accepted by them if they if they went with a different contractor? No, I haven't. And yeah, I knew that. I knew the answer before I asked that question. Yeah, and like so you're the you're the source that gave them this knowledge and this free septic system. You could be five grand higher, and I'm not saying that you're gonna do that to make more money from the system. Right. But like if you're the quality of your work and the different type, they don't care. Like, Hey, you're the specialist. You're the one that showed me how to get this thing. It's yours. Like you've yeah. built that trust and relationship. So, you know, doing the septic thing for, for 30 plus years now, um, since, you know, the original very first start, um, we have developed what I consider to be a pretty good relationship and a pretty good reputation with both our customer base as well as our, our regulators, you know, our, our local, you know, Department of Natural Resources. And I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, hey, I, I have a septic I, I need put in. And I tell them, well, all right, give me a few days, you know, let me pull some numbers together and I'll get you a price. And they're like, no, don't worry about it. Just get us on your schedule. We want you to do it. And that's a good feeling because that tells me that these people know our reputation. They know that we do good work and that they know there's a very good possibility that they may be able to go out and get a cheaper price, but they they want the craftsmanship. They want the reputation. They want the the quality that that we have strived to to build for the last 30 years. And um, generally speaking, if, if I have somebody that, that I turn on to the grant program and they find out that they can do this for free. Um, the deal is sealed generally. I mean, 100%. They, you know, there, and, and I could show you email after email from customers where they've said, you know, I can't believe no one else ever told us about this or, you know, thank you so much for turning us on to this. Um, 
And that's that's why it's kind of shocking to me because I'm like, I, I can't believe that more contractors aren't using this as a sales tool. You know, have you, and, have you ever thought about doing like social media or YouTube videos where you just basically <laughs> scroll the emails from customers? <laughs> well, you're promoting the program saying, want to learn you know, more? So, Contact us today. So one of the things that, that I'm up against is 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 time. I wish, you know, there's 24 hours in a day and you just can't get it all in. And I, you know, we have a company Facebook page and, and I I try to be good about taking pictures when we do jobs yeah. and posting stuff and different things. But, you know, everything's always so busy. And I, I, I joke with my kids, my, my one son, he's he's wanting me to buy him a drone with a camera. He tells me, Dad, I could be your your marketing guy. You know, I come out and fly the drone over to job sites and take pictures and post them on your Facebook page. And um, I'm like, yeah, I said, we need somebody to, you know what I mean? And it's such a fine line. You, you do all that advertising and marketing and putting that out there. But then at the same time, you're thinking to yourself, we're already so busy. We can't see straight. Do we want to fuel that fire? You know, do yeah. we want to take that on? Um, because you hate turning down work. You hate to tell somebody no. Um, and I don't expect people to wait months and months for us to provide them a service. You know what I mean? They, they need their stuff done. They, they got to move. But at the same time, you know, you hate to turn down work. You hate to miss opportunities. Um, but I just don't think it's fair to my customers yeah. to to have to make them wait are, that long, you know? Are you capped out on where you want the company to grow to as far as, like, crews, equipment, and employees? Or is this you know, the crossroads you're at now where you're debating if, you know, do we scale it, it, and create another? It It, it is. Um, it, it is a bit of a crossroads because I'm in a position now where, you know, much like my dad was when he was younger – you know, I'm still working a, another full time job for benefits. Oh, and um, and and the the reason I'm there is is I, I mean I like what I do there. Don't get me wrong, I work for a local uh, local water authority. Um, I like what I do, but you know I've got three kids and a wife that that you know my number one focus is making sure that they're taken care of, and um, I carry the benefits and health insurance. You know, we could have a we could have a whole another podcast just talking about health insurance. It's so expensive. And, and that's kind of the crossroads I'm at now is, um, you know, every year when the weather turns warm, I, I, I start getting that itch and I start thinking, is, is this, the, this the year that I, I really, I pull the plug and I dive a hundred percent in. And I know that time's coming. Um, inevitably I, I just, my gut up to this point hasn't told me that it's the right time. And I'm, I'm really waiting for my, for my stomach to tell me do this. You know what I mean? I, I love and that. Cause the head can talk you into a lot of shit. It, it can. The, it the absolutely gut, the can. The gut never, usually never guides you wrong. Yeah. And so for whatever reason, I just, I haven't committed to, to doing that yet. There's a whole lot of other opportunities that, that are going to open up when I make that decision. But like I said, my, you know, my, my number one driving factor behind that decision obviously is my, my wife and kids. And, uh, I just, I refuse to let my family have subpar health care and health insurance for me to chase a dream. Um, even though the dream is well established and doing well, I just don't feel right making my young kids take a sacrifice for something that I'm trying to do, because I know ultimately in due time, it, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of figuring out when exactly that time is. Um, as far as size, we have a small, you know, right now it's, it's myself. My dad is full time on the ground with two full time guys every day. I've got another guy that works three days a week, primarily running my dump truck for me, um, hauling stone from the local quarry to our yard down here because we buy and sell a ton of stone, uh, crusher run, 57 stone, wash gravel, fill dirt, topsoil, all that stuff. Um, so he primarily is in the truck full time those three days a week. And um, I like the small setting 
Um, I, I, I don't want to be one of the big guys. I can tell you that for sure. I, my dad and I are both extremely anal when it comes to quality and the way things are done. And naturally, the bigger you get and the more you have to extract yourself from what's going on on a daily basis, you expose yourself to more opportunities for the quality to decline. And that's one thing that him and I both agree on wholeheartedly is that there is no room for cut corners. There is no room for taking the cheap road. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that I really pride myself in is, is that level of quality that I think we provide to our customers. And, and I don't want to sacrifice that. And my two cents, Neil, and like from the outside in, we've only talked for about an hour now, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but my experience with other companies and even businesses that I've owned in the past, the quality doesn't suffer when you expand on your expertise. Mm -hmm. So like if you expanded and you only stayed with septic systems, mm -hmm. like it's easy to take that and duplicate the process from one crew to the next. Then you just manage over that. It's when yeah. you start going into some trucking, some pond, mm -hmm. some driveway, some culverts, that's when the quality suffers because right. you're just doing too many different services. Right. Right. Yeah. And I would agree with that. Um, there is a, there's a, a certain level of quality that, that we, dad and I both kind of expect in anything we do. Now, naturally, there's some, some aspects of the business requires more attention to detail to make that quality happen versus some other areas. Um, but we do, we have a, a pretty broad line card as to what we do. And, and I will say that the, the guys that help us, they, they're on board with it. I mean, they, they agree and they strive to do the right thing every time, to do it the right way every time. Um, but it's it's really a matter of being able to be 100 percent boots on the ground and to be able to be there to show these the, the new guys, you know, as we do expand or whatever, to really be able to show them what the expectations are and make sure that that they're given the same amount of heart to it that, that we are every day. And um, that's where I feel I really need to take that next step and be there every day yeah. in order to ensure that that can happen. The last four years, I mean, we, we, we've grown exponentially over the last four years. When I look at our, our, our summary sheets, you know, for the, the uh, gross receipts and things like that. And in, in the QuickBooks, I mean, it's, it's going up, up, up. And um, I don't expect that this year is going to be any different, um, you know, bar no major catastrophes. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm definitely optimistic. Um, I wish I had that crystal ball to say for sure, you know, what's what's going to happen and where we're going to go. Yeah, but um, like you talked about it, Neil, like, it doesn't matter what happens. You're in wastewater. <laughs> like, absolutely. I mean, it's I tell guys all the time, like, Find something you can do that's damn near recession proof because you want to make a million yeah. dollars with a mulcher clearing trees. You're going to have some lean years. Right. When Because people do that shit for recreation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing is, um, you know, the the wastewater and, and even the water industry, with it being as heavily regulated as it is, there's licenses, licenses and things like that that you have to have. So that for for us is it's to some extent job security because, you know, anybody and their brother can go out and like you said, buy a skid steer and a mulching head and and go to the state and get a seventy five dollar business license. And all of a sudden we're in the land clearing business, um, whereas with the water and the wastewater, you know, having those licenses, they've they've gotten so strict on the requirements. Not just anybody can go out and get that license now to do that septic work or or operate that treatment plant and do that stuff. So there's the young people that are coming into the industry, the ones that are going to be able to obtain those licenses because they have to have those years of prior experience, you know, working for a licensed person. Um, those are the ones that, that I, we have to figure out how do we get them? How do we train them? How do we keep them and make sure that they're given it? the same all that we're giving it. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, I have no doubt in my mind. I mean, we're, 
we're, we're going to do just fine. We've, we've been doing good all these years. Things have gotten better every year. Um, but that is the one peace of mind is that if things really did take a dump tomorrow, some of our work may suffer. I shouldn't say suffer, may go away. We may not have the, you know, the pond work and the different other things that we do, but the wastewater and the water infrastructure and utility work that we're involved in, it's always going to be there. And that, that is really our bread and butter anyway. The, the other stuff that we do to me is just icing on the cake. The, the wastewater is really what we put our name on every day. So I've been reading a book called 10 X is easier than two X. And basically it's when you want to double your business, like there's so many different avenues you can take. Mm -hmm. They almost get like analysis by paralysis, like paralysis by analysis. Cause you don't know right. which one to take, but if you right. want to 10 X your business, like there's only one, maybe two ways to do it. And if you commit to those and just cut everything else out, like you can, it actually makes it easier because you have mm -hmm. less option, less options. Yeah. So like when I hear you talking about that, I'm like, God, if you really want to like grow and develop that second crew and all that, like let the ponds and everything roll and just hit waste. You, you're you level four and you've got 30 years experience. Like I know it's fun to not do the same job every day, but it's mm -hmm. the same job every day that makes the growth right happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think ultimately, you know, the the business name you know Girardi Septic Service and we we kept it that way for a reason because that is that's the heart and soul of what we do that's the bread and butter of the business and that's always going to be sort of our our, our front line you know what I mean gig um, the other stuff when we have the time and we're able to do it you know we we do it it's there we're capable why not um, but the the septic thing is really what we sort of pride ourselves on it's yeah. it's what we uh it's what we've built our reputation on for the most part um and ultimately you know to be very honest it's it's really the most rewarding because it's 99 percent of the the septic work that we do is for residential customers it's for the the end user out there it's the consumer it's the people who are doing the same thing we are every day they're they're getting up they're going to work they're you know working a full-time job and hustling every day and they appreciate it when they see somebody that's coming out and providing them a service and doing the same thing for them absolutely um, there's a lot to so, be said for that reward of actually working with the end user and seeing their gratitude yeah. And, you know, big thing for us is or me, especially with with that end user approach in mind is the one thing that I, I really see lacking in the on site uh, industry is education uh, for the homeowner, for the end user. So many customers, I we go out and we do a service call or, or something for them or they call in and tell me they're having an issue you know, one of the common ones I get is I just had a new septic put in two years ago and it's backed up. I think I need my tank pumped. Well, the first thing I ask them is, well, have you cleaned your effluent filter? Well, what's that? And, you know, so I explained to them, you know, in that effluent end of your septic tank, there should be a filter. That filter needs to be cleaned quarterly. You know, you pull it out, spray it off with a hose, put it back. Oh, no, nobody ever showed us that. There's so many of my colleagues that are out there, they're finishing the job, but they're not educating the customer on the proper way to maintain it, the proper way to take care of it. And maintenance is, is the longevity of these things. So yeah. if you're not, if you're not in my mind, if you're not educating your customer when you're done on how to take care of what you've given them, you're really selling them short because you're not fulfilling in my mind, your obligation and, to that customer. And Neil, in today's world, it takes you one hour to have one of your employees with a cell phone follow you around. And then you post that video to like YouTube mm -hmm. and anyone that gets that type of system gets the right. link to that video. Right. It's like, like, it's not, you don't have to spend an hour with every homeowner. Like, right. Like today's resources allow us to build those things in advance and spend mm -hmm. a day and then, you know, get the the reward of those fruits of labor right. for a long time. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's either the, in a, the unknowingness, how to do it, the unsurety of how to do it, or just sheer laziness. It's one of those three. Right. Right. 
Right. And typically, you know, I, I think it's, it's a combination truth be told. Yeah. You know, I know there's, 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 it's like anything else. There's some guys out there that, that, you know, they just want to collect the check and, and run. There's some guys that walk away from the job and say, dang, I didn't show that lady how to clean her tank filter. And then they just never get back to it because things yeah. are busy. Um, yeah. But it's uh, the, the education side of it for me um, is, is a big thing. And, you know, the, the satisfaction that you get out of your customer. I mean, once you show them that, you know, that the reaction you get from, them, oh, well, that's that's all I have to do. I'm like, yeah, that's it. It's very simple. And, you know, oh, well, thank you so much. You know, I mean, you, you think about it, you just saved them three or four hundred dollars. You know, they were going to call and get their tank pumped because yeah. they thought it was backing up. In, In five the, minutes, you saved them four hundred bucks. Yeah. And I preach to people all the time we work with in our coaching and consulting program. Mm -hmm. Like if you can be educational with your customers and actually teach them something during any, any part of the process, doesn't matter what service you're providing. Right. Like if you can be educational and teach them, there's a, there, there's actual studies that show when you teach somebody something new, they automatically hold you in high regard. Yeah. I, I definitely believe that. I, I mean, I think anybody that's investing that amount of money into a product that you're selling them or a service that you're selling them, I believe that they have the right to know everything about it inside now. Now, obviously, I'm not going to teach my customer how to install a septic system that I put right. in in their backyard, but I wholeheartedly believe that they at least once in the middle of that process at some point in time, they should absolutely have the right to have you meet them at the back door, walk them out into the backyard in the middle of that site and say, okay, here's what you've got. This is your tank. This is your D box or whatever. This is how it works. They don't necessarily have to understand a hundred percent how it operates, but 10 years down the road, when they go to sell that home and the new homeowner says, well, what's back here? At least they have the knowledge to say, well, this is here, that's there. And you know, the water comes out here and goes there. Right. Because that, that new person doesn't know what's there. They weren't there when it was put in. And just that simple piece of five minute knowledge can save people so much headache, you know, so much frustration. Mm -hmm. um, something right. as simple as running an electric line to a shed in the backyard and they, they trench through their septic system because they didn't realize the lines went that far, you know, um, Comcast, you know, running cable to somebody's house. If I could tell you how many septic systems the cable company has trenched through because they're not covered in a mis utility ticket. And of course, you know, let's assume they have a good, good mark out. The septic system's not marked. Right. And I can't begin to tell you how many private cable contractors have trenched right through the septic system because the homeowner didn't realize that that's where their stuff was, you yeah. know? And five minutes with the installer when it was put in could have saved them a whole lot of trouble. Hmm. So, hundred percent. Yeah, a couple of the things that we you, you kind of noted on when I asked you what it because you've been in the business for a while and that you guys have a legacy business it was like some advice that you would have for other entrepreneurs. You know, and I think a couple of them are pretty easy, right? Like start small, avoid debt, like buy used equipment, rent, Absolutely. like just don't drop two hundred k just so you can say you own an excavation company totally agree with you on that one. The one that I really liked was like learning from other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. I think too many people forget to listen and like close their mouth, open their ears mm -hmm. because there's Absolutely. so much knowledge from other business owners or other people, you know, that have already been where you're at. Yep. So one of the big things that I found and that, that I'm, I'm guilty of doing is, you know, social media has opened so many doors to so many different aspects of life over the last 10 years. And there's so many, you know, pages and forums and different things on Facebook that the contractors are a member of, whether it's, um, you know, utility work or excavation work or whatever. And one of the things that I that I do is. I'm a member of a lot of those groups and I'll scroll through them things and I'll see pictures 
that people posted. And there's, you know, touching on the subject, there's there's one in particular that's like septic system installation and repairs or something on Facebook. And I'll scroll through that. And there's so many guys that post stuff, pictures on there and ask questions. And I see a lot of the responses and some of the responses to their questions are good. They're informative. You know what I mean? Others are just downright ignorant. You know what I mean? And I try to refrain from commenting on anything I see because I there's there's more than one way to skin a cat. And to me, it's interesting to see how things are done differently, you know, where I'm at compared to where you may be or where somebody else may be. And one of the things I found is that I like to read a lot of the comments, but I kind of like to let them soak in a little bit and 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 think on them before I reply. Um, and part of that is because I think as people, you know, we're programmed that in our minds, we think our way is the only way. And our way, it, it may be perfect. It, it may be the best way to do something, but it's probably not whether we like it or not the only way to do it. And I try to tell myself, listen, you've been doing this a long time, but don't write this guy's way of doing this off just yet. There may be some valid reason to that behind the scenes that you just haven't caught on to yet. Yeah. Excuse me. And, you know, I, so many people are so quick to, to jump in and, and give their two cents because they don't, they're not willing to take that five minutes and really process what they're seeing or what they're hearing somebody say. Um, you know, and I'll admit it, I've jumped the gun before and, you know, I've had somebody present something to me and said, no, I don't like that idea. I'm going to do it my way. And then it comes back to bite you in the butt. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you, and I've gotten better about it as I've gotten older, obviously, but there's, there's just so many different ways, different possibilities, different techniques, um, you know, and, 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 and there's more and more that come every day, you know, as, as people do stuff, as the, as the industry evolves, um, whether it be technology, whatever, um, there's so many different possibilities out there. And I found that if you just shut up sometimes and watch and listen, it, sometimes you learn more than you think. And, um, I try, I try to do that more and more contrary to what some people may say about me. Um, I do try to do that more and more. And I, and I think that it's, it's something that and separates it, I guess, as you mature in yep. the business, you know, it, and I think it, the it, level of expertise is plays into that too. Like for me, it was just a few weeks ago, one of the companies we work with to help us with our marketing for skids to your nation, we had a meeting and he presented this idea on for targeting on social media accounts. And the first two sentences he said, my initial feeling was, this is ridiculous. Right. I don't want to do this. And then I had to think to myself, I'm like, he's been doing this for us for three years. He does it for other companies. He's excited about this. There's obviously something that I'm missing. So I just shut my mouth right. and let him talk for 45 minutes. At the end of that meeting, I was like, I'm all in. What do you need from us? Right. Like because I didn't snap judge on that first yeah. two sentences. Yeah. And it's, it's very easy to do, you know? Um, and, and I, you know, I find myself, I, I, I do it and I have to catch myself and you, you sometimes you just have to take a step back and, you know, look at, um, you know, look at the big picture and see, see what you're missing. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I, I think as you, as I get older, as, as, as I mature more in the business, more in my role in the business, um, you know, it becomes more and more evident that there's a lot to be learned. And, and I don't think, you know, you have to be humble enough to know that no matter how much you think, you know, there's always somebody that probably knows a little bit more. And, uh, you know, you got to be willing to accept that, whether it's. And if, and if you want to be a great business owner, you'll go seek those people out to learn from them. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So, yeah. And then I, the other last thing that I would just to wrap into this was I used to own a business with my brother and I would get so fixated on the process of, of what he was doing mm -hmm. 
that I had to learn like, oh, is the outcome the same that I want? Are we on agreeance of the outcome? Right. And then like, just leave them alone to let it do them his way. Right. right. So I, I was like, I tell guys all the time, if you have a lead that's been with you for numerous years, and like he knows the quality, he knows the standards, you're happy with them, you trust them. Don't manage the process, manage the outcome. Yes, absolutely. Yep. I agree. Because you're, there's, like you said, there's seven ways to get to the, the finish line. Mm -hmm. And while yours might be faster for you, his might be faster for him. And at the end of the day, it's all ROI and quality and time. Yep. Absolutely. So, yep. Good advice, man. Good advice. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. We've been talking now for a little over an hour. Is there anything else that you want to dive into or? Um, no, not, not particular. Um, I, I think, uh, I think what you're doing is a, is a great thing here, you know, given, given some people the opportunity to kind of get their, get their voice out there, you know, um, I'm sure every, every industry, um, you know, everybody that you interview, you know, has their own story and I'm sure sitting in your chair, it's probably a pretty cool deal to, to hear some of them. Um, you know, I've, I've listened to, to a few of them, uh, online and, um, it's, uh, I, I just I, I think all in all, it's 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 a neat, neat deal what you're doing, you know, give give people, you know, like me with small business owners from whatever background they might be, you know, an opportunity to kind of to share their story and, uh, you know, help to grow their business and, and get their name out there. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I'm sure you've got a ton of listeners and, you know, some are probably in my area and, and some probably aren't. But um Nonetheless, it's it's an opportunity for guys like me to, uh, you know, to voice their concerns. And, and let's face it, nothing gets done without some kind of dialogue beforehand. You know, something has to get the ball rolling. And I'm sure you have no shortage of topics, um, especially in today's age with, uh, you know, topics to discuss there. You know, as business owners, we have so many things that are stacking up against us, you know, whether it's health insurance, attracting quality help, um, you know, inflation in general. Um, there's so many things out there that need to change and so many people that uh, need to get involved. Um, so, no, I think it's a great thing what you're doing. And, um, you know, I would encourage anybody that has the opportunity to to talk to you, to, to take advantage of it, um, you know, get your story out there and share your share your gripes and your, you know, your, uh, your highlights with, with all of us. And, um, you know, I think it's a good thing. Appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. It is. It's my favorite part of the week is when I actually look down and see my schedule has a couple, an interview or two on it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's, it's, it's like Christmas. I get a little excitement cause I gotta do some research on you guys. I get to do a little social media creeping. Um, right. you know, I, I feel like an ex-girlfriend sometimes <laughs> so check them out. But then, like, then the conversation, and I, I always preach to everyone that before we get, I'm like, listen, there's no structure to this. We're just going right. to, like, hit some topics and, like, let it roll because I want it to be natural and organic. Yeah. And I want to give you guys the opportunity to, like, really dig into something sometimes so that we can learn. I can learn, too. And, um, you know, I try to come in. I've always been a very inquisitive person. So to be able to, like, ask some of the questions and expand on topics because it's right. so easy. It's so easy for you to, like, like that program it would have been easy for you just to zip right by it because you deal with it every day right and i was like stop the truck there's got to be an enormous amount of people that are in the septic industry that have no clue what this program even is yeah yeah absolutely so and i think um you know one of the things you know that i would throw out just kind of as an end cap so to speak we got where we are really by two two points that, that I really jump out to me. One is exactly what you touched on a little while ago about the, the debt thing. Um, I get so many calls every week from banks and this one and that one wanting to lend money. Oh, we got $200,000. We can lend you just sign your name, blah, blah, blah. To the young guys that I see on the social media pages and the different forums that, Number one, God bless you for being willing to get out there every day and bust your asses because there's not enough of those guys left in the world. But on top of that, don't let the shiny yellow paint and the fancy clean cabs seduce you. 
we have nice newer equipment that we're running now, but we didn't get there overnight. We never bought our first brand new machine until about four years ago. Um, that $30,000 dump truck makes the same money that that $230,000 dump truck does. Maybe it's not as pretty, maybe it's not as shiny, but they'll take it away on the same rollback as that $30,000 one if you don't pay for it. So the debt thing to me is one of the most crucial elements. Do not overextend yourself. So many people have that feeling like they have to compete. You know, I've got several friends of mine that are in the same line of work and I, I saw them buy new equipment and see them go by the job with their shiny new excavator on the trailer. And you think to yourself, man, look at that. That's nice. But they did the same thing we did. They, they busted their butts and they, they built up to it and they finally got to a place where they could afford to do it. Um, I love the fact that I'm able to tell those guys calling me every day, wanting to lend us money that we don't finance stuff. We pay cash money because we've got ourselves to a position where we're fortunate enough to be able to do that. And if I were to get sick tomorrow or dad were to get sick tomorrow, if we had to shut down completely, I don't have to worry about paying a $3,000 excavator payment or a $2,000 skid steer payment. It gives you some cushion. It gives you some time to recuperate without completely losing things. Um, and then the, the second thing was, you know, do not under any circumstances shortchange your customers when it comes to what you owe them. And when I say that, I mean, make sure you're treating your customers just like you would want to be treated if they were doing the work for you. Every customer that comes to us, I don't care if it's a $4,000 repair job or a $40,000 new installation, I treat them the same. Money is money. So many guys get attracted to the big dollars. And when I look at my numbers in the books, there's a whole lot of small figures in there that are contributing to what that final number was. And work is work. Be thankful for what you get. Be thankful for what you can do. And don't don't write people off. Um, the worst thing you can do for your reputation is to not call somebody back because that two hundred dollar service call ain't worth your time. Yeah, and then Neil, um, it's so true, right? Like you do a really good job, that person might only tell one or two people. Mm -hmm. But if you do a bad job, gonna they're going to tell 10, 20, 30, <laughs> 50 people. So yep. you can't afford to shortchange your customers. No, it's um, just have pride in what you do. You know what I mean? And and yeah. that's, that's my big thing. That's what I tell everybody is, uh, you know, have pride in what you do. And uh, when you walk away from it, if, if you can't walk away from it and be willing to sign your name on it when where somebody can see it, then you're not doing something right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Neil, that's a great finishing spot for me. I, I can't think of a better way to wrap up a show than by talking about having pride. So thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us and being a guest on the show today and sharing your years of knowledge and your story with all of us. We appreciate it. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And guys out there, we are proud to serve you high-quality American-made attachments, too, at skidsteernation.com. And if you own a business, whether you're just getting started or burn it five or six, eight years, and you're, you're just at a plateau, you're struggling, you're not sure how to grow it, we're proud to serve you in becoming better business owners, too. Head over to groundbreakinggrowth.com. Check out what we can do for you. We're actually doing a live six-week training right now with some guys and the benefits they're seeing instantly are making an impact in their life and their attitude and their business. So schedule a call. You'll talk to me directly and we'll see if we can help you out until next week, guys. Enjoy the show.